uh, this is my title. Why isn't it forwarding? Okay, this is my outline, but I'm gonna make that my summary at the end. Now I'm gonna get right down to business, which is talking about uh, Heron's formula for a triangle, one of the most basic formula uh, in classical Euclidean geometry, which has hence in the, in the past only worked in two dimensions. And I'm gonna show you how to extend it to three dimensions and uh, tell you that I'm also quite sure that that formula extends to n dimensions as well. Uh, but to do that, you have to look at it a little differently than it has previously been done. Uh, so will that A, B, and C be the uh, lengths of the edges of a triangle A, B, C? And will that S be its semi-perimeter, that is one half its perimeter? Uh, then uh, the Heron parameters, as they are known, of the triangle are the deviations of the triangle inequalities from equality. Uh, and that's shown here on this displayed equation. Uh, it follows that the distances are determined by these Heron parameters simply by summing them pairwise, which means that the Heron parameters determine the triangle up to isometry. Uh, in fact, they are somewhat better than that because unlike the edge lengths, the uh, Heron parameters do not have to satisfy the triangle inequality. Any non-negative numbers when treated as Heron parameters will give rise to a triangle uh, where the edge length satisfied the triangle inequality. They also allow the squared area of the triangle to be written very simply as the product of the Heron parameters and the uh, semi-perimeter. Uh, and then that much is pretty well known as a compact way to write Heron's formula. But the next step is new. You look at that product UVW uh, as a determinant of a symmetric real matrix. And that uh, is the right way to look at Heron's formula. Uh, first, before we get on to the generalization, let's look at the geometry that makes it all come true. The Heron parameters are nothing more or less than the distances from the vertices of the triangle to what are known as the in-touch points at which the uh, in-circle of the triangle touches its edges. Uh, they are also equal to uh, the distances from the vertices of the triangle to the x-touch points at which the three X circles touch either its edges or the lines spanned by those edges, which is shown on the right-hand figure there. And it's that intimate connection to the geometry of the in circle and X circles that provides the, the clue by which I was able to extend Heron's formula. And that's because the same sort of thing happens with the in sphere of a tetrahedron. Uh, in fact, the distances, uh, for example, the red distances shown here from one of the, vert the vertex C of the triangle to the in touch points uh, at which the in sphere touches its ad adjacent uh, faces are all equal. And that's true at each all four vertices. So there are really only four such distances. But now you can also see, uh, look, just looking at the figure, that the triangles uh, into which the faces are divided by their respective in-touch points uh, come in congruent pairs, where each congruent pair shares an edge of the tetrahedron. And you can see that perhaps even more clearly on the right, uh, where the edge AB and the uh, corresponding in-touch triangles, ABN and ADL, are clearly congruent. And uh, that means that just as I do, the Heron parameters are defined as the length of the segments into which the sides of the triangle are divided by their in-touch points. I'm now going to define what I'm going to call the natural parameters of a tetrahedron to be twice the in-touch triangles areas, as shown here. Uh, so there are 12 in-touch triangles all in all, but because they come in congruent pairs, there are only six such parameters denoted by U, V, uh, and so on up through Z. The factor of two incidentally is included just because I prefer to make, uh, make everything equivalent by working with parallelogram areas rather than triangle areas. And I'll also be working with the volume of the parallel pipe uh, rather than the volume of the tetrahedron, which is one sixth the volume of the parallel pipe -ed. And with that, uh, here's the extension of Heron's formula to tetrahedra and beyond. Uh, if you let S be twice the uh, surface area of the tetrahedron, the fourth power of the volume, which I'll be denoting by T, uh, is simply uh, this formula shown here, which as you see, involves a now four by four determinant in these natural parameters. Uh, the 
Uh, in radius is also given uh, by this formula. Uh, it's just uh, a well-known fact that uh, R times S is equal to T. So you get both the end radius and the volume out of this formula. Uh, if you expand that, uh, the negative of that to permanent, uh, it turns into that polynomial shown down there. And if you substitute for the, uh, the square roots of the natural parameters for the natural parameters themselves, and that becomes a polynomial in the squares of the square roots of the natural parameters. And that polynomial factorizes into four bilinear factors, uh, which is how you can begin to interpret what's going on. But before going back to that, let's ask where is the geometric algebra? Well, this is geometry, so it's geome got to be geometric algebra in there somewhere. The answer to that question goes through what are well known to be Cayley Menger determinants. I hope most people here have seen them because I'm not going to have time to define them. And to a generalization thereof known as Palata determinants, which uh, give the areas of what are known as the medial sections of simplices instead of the volumes of those simplices. Uh, so, uh, in the case of a tetrahedron, the medial sections are known as the medial parallelograms. And uh, they are simply the parallelograms which are spanned by the midpoints of a cycle of four edges. And in the uh, case shown here in the drawing on the right, uh, you can see the uh, parallelogram uh, VXYW. Uh, which is formed by the midpoints of the, of the indicated uh, edges of the tetrahedron. And as you can see, the uh, sides of the parallelogram are pairwise uh, parallel to the edges of the original tetrahedron. So uh, these, the areas of these figures turn out to be very important in the derivation that I made of the formula that I just chose, showed you. And uh, that shows, shows up as follows. The squared area of a medial parallelogram with, uh, is quite easy to express it. We're going to denote it by this funny formula shown over here on the left, the first equation. So that's going to henceforth mean the area of a medial parallelogram. Uh, that is, of course, going to be the, uh, the uh, norm of the bivector generated by the, vertex, uh, the vectors along two sides of the parallelogram showing a common vertex, in this case, B. Uh, and you can write that as the difference between the corresponding points. Uh, you can take the fact that those points are uh, the midpoints of the uh, edges of the tetrahedron. You then observe that um, the uh, point C cancels in the first factor of the bivector, and uh, the point A cancels in the second. So what you're looking at actually is the outer product of the vectors uh, of two opposite edges of the tetrahedron uh, as shown on the last beginning of the last line. Uh, I'm going to denote that, uh, or that can be written as uh, the vector from A to B wedged with the vector from C to D. And as a shorthand, I'll be denoting that by vector by that last formula shown there. And what you can show uh, via fairly straightforward uh, manipulations is that the uh, bivectors bi of the exterior faces of the tetrahedron are related to those of the uh, interior faces, as I call these uh, medial parallelograms, uh, by simple signed sums as shown here. These are in fact a generalization of the very well-known Minkowski's identity by which, uh, which uh, is a relationship among, a linear relationship among the by vectors of the four faces of the tetrahedron, as it's been long known for well over a century now. In fact, it was probably known to Grassman. Okay, so with that, uh, and those relationships play, played a key role in the derivation that I carried out here. So uh, let's look at now at uh, what you can do. You can turn those, invert those linear relationships and write the uh, into area, the aerial by vectors of the interior faces as uh, thumbs or differences in this case of the aerial vectors by vectors of the exterior faces. And that can be done in two separate ways for each of the three interior faces. 
Uh, you now use the fact that we are working in Euclidean geometry, and hence, if you have one vector equal to the sum of any other two or bivector or anything else, uh, that vector will be let, will be a norm less than or equal to the sum of the norms of the other two. And you simply apply that to the relationship you're looking at up there, and it implies a system of linear inequalities among the areas of the internal and external phases of the tetrahedron, which are indicated here. Uh, there is, for each uh, medial parallelogram, uh, two triples that can be obtained that way. You simply swap terms on the left-hand and right-hand side of that first equation up there and apply the same formula for uh, to, to get the corresponding inequality, and that gives you a triple. Uh, and it turns out that all in all, you get 18 such tetrahedron inequalities, as I call them. Uh, these inequalities are stronger than the well-known inequality, which says that the sum of the areas of any three exterior faces exceeds the area of the fourth face. That formula is very well known, but you can derive it from these formula uh, quite simply, so it's a weaker formula. This, this is the correct generalization of the triangle inequality to pi vectors. So uh, an algebraic form for the natural parameters, which I have so far we defined geometrically, uh, can be derived as follows. Uh, you simply look at the deviations of the uh, tetrahedron inequalities from holding as equalities, just as the Heron parameters. They did with the Heron, to define the Heron parameters back on my, almost my first slide. Uh, okay, and we'll also be needing, uh, we're gonna denote these, if, in the case of each triple, we're gonna have three such deviations denoted here is tau one, tau two, and tau three. Tau zero will be denoted, will be their sum. Uh, it's kind of an analog of the semi-perimeter for a triangle, but this is uh, a bit different. So what you can then show via some straightforward uh, trigonometry uh, combined with geometric algebra, uh, that the natural parameters are given algebraically by these expressions shown uh, down here where you take the sum of the deviations of the tetrahedron inequality from sat saturation, you take the product with the non-degeneracy factor, and you divide by, in this case, four times the exterior uh, surface area. Okay, so that's very good. It's a nice, simple, uh, deep end uh, formula. But what about these other uh, deviations of the tetrahedron inequalities for saturation tau two and tau three? Well, that leads to a natural definition of what I call the inverse parameters, uh, which will be the analogous formula, uh, but now with these with tau two and tau three rather than tau zero and tau one. Okay, and those are turn out to be uh, related to the areas of the triangles into which the x touch points of the tetrahedron's x spheres divide its four exterior faces, and. Uh, another reason they are very interesting is because when you put them together with the corresponding uh, complementary, as I call them, natural parameters, uh, and divide by the square of the in radius, you get the edge lengths of the tetrahedron, which immediately shows you that everything I've got here is sufficient to determine the tetrahedron up to isometry. Uh, and that's very nice. So now uh, when we start to ask, what, what do the zeros of this formula, of my formula look like? Uh, well, the zeros imply that the volume of the tetrahedron is zero, but they also imply that the in radius of the tetrahedron has become zero, which means that the distances in my zeros have gone to, in the zeros of my formula, go to infinity as you go to a uh, degenerate tetrahedron. Uh, this was kind of a shock to me when I proudly derived this extension of Heron's formula to higher dimensions and then found that the uh, zeros thereof were not just uh, in quadruples of points in, in the Euclidean plane. Uh, they were something that's quite literally outside the realm of what is normally regarded as Euclidean geometry. So I spent the last year trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, and uh, I call it the mystery of aerial degeneracy. So the first thing to notice is that as the distances go to infinity, the, uh, you can generate sequences of te non-degenerate tetrahedra, which asymptotically approach one of these zeros. And as you generate them and use graphics to make pictures and watch what's happening, you see that as you approach one of these zeros, the vertices not only go off to infinity, but they go off to infinity along the line with fixed relative rates. 
uh, sometimes in the same direction, sometimes in the opposite direction. And, uh, but nevertheless, uh, because the, of this previous formula, you can see that the ratios, even though the distances go to infinity, when you take their ratios, the uh, in radius squared cancels out. So the ratios of the distances remain well defined. Uh, the, at the same time, the uh, seven faces of the tetri, uh, the normal vectors to the seven faces uh, become coplanar, i.e. the bivector share a common factor, uh, but they are not collinear the way they would be in a planar tetrahedron that had been squashed into the plane. In fact, I don't think anybody, to my knowledge, has ever asked the question, why is it that the aerial vectors of a non-degenerate tetrahedron span three dimensions? When you squish it into the plane, they sweat, that they were projected onto the plane. They only span a single dimension. Why isn't there anything in between? Well, folks, there is. Okay, but in any case, when you do um, project it down into the plane, all the complementary products then vanish, and the zeros correspond to a quadruple of points, not in the Euclidean plane, but in the special affine plane. That is the uh, plane modulo uh, the affine transformations which preserve the areas or special affine group, as I guess it would be called. Uh, Finally, you can show that the manifold of all the zeros is a 5D manifold, uh, which is canonically homeomorphic to a quotient of the Klein, famous Klein quadrant by an action of a reflection group, which is isomorphic to the cyclic group of uh, order uh, two uh, direct product with itself four times. Uh, and you can show that via the factorization I mentioned of the polynomial omega, uh, in terms of it, the square roots of the natural parameters. Whole geometric interpretation, though, remains to be found. Under or ordinary conditions, the Klein quadric is uh, uh, an algebraic realization of the Grassmannian of all lines in uh, projective free space. Uh, here, it has a completely different geometric interpretation. And in fact, you can look at the big picture, which uh, decomposes it into a lattice of uh, submanifolds, uh, which can be defined by which complementary products vanish. The full manifold is five dimensional, as indicated on the second level of this lattice. Uh, if you require any complementary product to vanish, it drops to a four dimensional manifold. Uh, you require any two to vanish, uh, two opposite, I would call them, because they correspond to opposite pairs. Uh, and that drops it to 3D, but you uh, try to add any more, and uh, I can interrupt really quick. it immediately drops down to uh, what is shown here, and goes all the way back down. To Timothy, we have yeah. to interrupt you shortly. Uh, you have five minutes left. I just want to let you know. Okay. So hence to the answers in the conformal algebra of geometric space, we're going to look at line bound vectors, uh, and we're going to start. Uh, looking at them and looking at the ways in which we can combine them to form tetrahedra. So I just um, look at de defining a line bound vector, vector here as the outer uh, product of uh, two conformal points with the pointed infinity. And that is geometrically uh, this, a, uh, the set of all mm -hmm. vectors of a given length and given orientation on a given line in three space. And this, which was Braspin's intuitive notion of what a line bound vector is, or an outer product for him, uh, is uh, because this, you have this symmetry where the vector is translated along the line, uh, that is kind of a gauge symmetry uh, corresponding to the additive group of the real numbers. And this is probably, I think we can credit Braspin with being the first one to observe a gauge symmetry in nature. Two line bound vectors then uh, span when you put them together and by taking their geometric product and breaking it down into its uh, scalar two vector and four vector parts, uh, you find uh, that these parts are also invariant under such translations of their constituent vectors along their respective line. Uh, the first one shows you that this is the essentially the angle or the product of opposite uh, edges. Uh, the uh, one in the middle turns out to have a norm equal to the area of a, one of the medial parallelograms or interior faces of the tetrahedron. And the four vector part is the volume element times the point at infinity. 
So we are generating or have defined a two dimensional set of tetrahedron always having the same volume. Astonishingly though, they also always have the same medial parallelogram up to translation through space, which is what this figure here is meant to show. Okay, an example of an affine planar zero is obtained uh, those, the other uh, faces, uh, the exterior faces and the other two medial parallelograms, their areas are changed by such translations. And it's only when the lines become parallel in space that all the areas become invariant with respect to such translations. And in fact, you then arrive at one of these pla affine planar zeros that I mentioned earlier. Hey, the other way to do it is to take a point in a plane bound by vector and put them together. And when you do that, you find out that the volume element is again in infinity times the volume element. So the volume is invariant as you uh, move A in the plane parallel to the plane of the other three vertices, B, C, and D, or as you subject uh, B, C, and D to an arbitrary area preserving affine transformation in their respective plane. So once again, uh, in this case, all the distances can become zero uh, in oh, somewhere in this set of uh, 3D, 3D set of tetrahedra all having the same volume. Uh, you can also realize in this framework, uh, Minkowski's identity, and in fact, this is something uh, well known to Grassman, that when you take the sum of the bi vectors uh, of the line bound vectors around any face of the tetrahedron, you get the free uh, bi vector of that face. And when you sum all 12 of the indicated line bound vectors shown here, uh, you, of course, since they come in uh, pairs related by an overall change of sign, you get an overall zero. And that's one way to prove Minkowski's uh, identity. Uh, it should also be noted that the um, north square norm of the bivector uh, of an exterior phase factorizes the appearance formula when you expand it in terms of the dot products or the squared distances. Uh, an affine squeeze transformation uh, is one sure. that, uh, for Would example, to the end. preserves the area. <laughs> Two minutes. Okay, preserves the area, uh, but maps the vertices to infinity. So here's a case where you have an area preserving affine transformation acting on a triangle in the plane that preserves the area and sends the vertices to infinity. If you generalize that to three dimensions by uh, considering this affine transformation shown here, which is not volume preserving, and you look at what happens as uh, you let sigma go to zero, uh, then you are squeezing the tetrahedron towards the z-axis. Uh, and asymptotically, that acts as a squeeze on the faces because they tend to become coplanar or co... Yeah, uh, their, their normal vectors tend to become coplanar. So asymptotically, the areas are preserved by such transformations. And in fact, you can show here that as you uh, let that parameter sigma, uh, one over the sigma is plotted down here on on the x-axis on the log scale, the areas uh, of the faces, seven faces are plotted here. And you can see that it converges very fast to well-defined values. And this way you generate one of the zeros of my formula, my extension of Heron's formula to tetrahedra. And this is my last uh, real slide. Uh, does all this have a hyperbolic interpretation in hyperbolic geometry? Because Squeeze transformations can be interpreted as hyperbolic rotations is one reason to suspect that. The other reason to suspect it is that the signature of that matrix, the matrix which you take the determinant of uh, is uh, with a minus sign thrown in, uh, minus 103 plus one. So that corresponds to the hyperboloid model of hyperbolic geometry. So uh, I do believe that uh, just as the uh, matrix of square distances times minus one, minus one half can be interpreted as a gram matrix uh, of an ideal tetrahedron in a hyperbolic space. And that's part of uh, modeling Euclidean geometry in the comparable model. In fact, that's what, make that, what, what, what makes the comparable model a good model of both hyperbolic geometry and Euclidean geometry. Uh, then this will have an interpretation as a component of the uh, of the aerial gram matrix of an ideal tetrahedron. Okay, so I'm now going to put up uh, this summary of my talk and I'll uh, stop for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timothy.
So we are a bit late, but we have still the opportunity for one question. It, it looks so, like there was a question in the chat. Okay. So so maybe, maybe uh, since that was the first one, we can see. So this this is from Garrett. It says, are there any relations of your formulas that carry over to a tetrahedron in hyperbolic or other geometries? Well, that's essentially the last question that I was asking. And uh, in fact, I'm looking for experts in hyperbolic geometry, which I am frankly not, uh, who'd like to collaborate with me on working out these connections. And uh, incidentally, there's a paper on the archive uh, referenced here where I've written all this stuff, stuff up in gory detail. 